Hey guys, Coach PJ here from XPT. Today I'm going to talk to you guys about breathing. And the reason I put this video together is every time I'm asked about breathing, or I tell people that I, I work on breath work, or breathing is a big part of what we teach, there are a few common questions that I get from that. Uh, one of them is, do you really have to teach people how to breathe? And the answer to that one is absolutely we do. But the other answer, the other question I always get is, oh, are you talking about uh, Wim Hof breathing? Or are you talking about uh, the pranayama that I do in yoga class? Or I do some breath work, I do X, Y, and Z. And what happens is people associate breathing with one specific method. And then, or they ask me, do you think I should start doing some breath work? Should I start doing this type of breathing? Or should I start doing this, this method? And what I always tell people is you, you have to think about each breathing method like you would an exercise. So if someone comes to me and says, should I be back squatting? The answer is it depends. It depends on your current goals, your mobility, your strength, your training history, all this other stuff. There's too many variables for me to just say, yes, every single person should be doing this. Uh, and it's going to depend on the situation, that day, what time of day, all of that stuff. So when you think about these different breathing practices, think about them like that. The Wim Hof method is like a back squat. Some people should be doing it. It's a great method. It can do a lot of great things. However, just like back squats, it's one of the best exercises out there. Does every, should everybody be doing it? Absolutely not. There's a lot of people who shouldn't start there. And actually, what I always tell people is that it's, a, it's pretty far down the chain. So there's probably five or six other things you need to really learn and master first before you should start doing something like a back squat that can, be, uh, that can cause a great demand on the body. So what I did today is I want to put together this little uh, graphic here to show you where some of these breathing methods fall on this spectrum of respiratory rates and then what's happening in the body so that you can judge if you should be starting on either end of the spectrum or what breathing methods are appropriate for you. So if we start off in the center here, this is our respiratory rate, how many breaths we take per minute. So when you see BPM, breath per minute. Right here is 10 to 14. That's the average breaths per minute that people take. Again, on average, very generalization, about 10 to 14 breaths per minute. At the low end of the spectrum, we've got one to six breaths per minute. And then at the high end of the spectrum, we've got 30 to 50 plus. So if we look at these different breathing methods, what we can see is as the respiratory rate decreases or increases, it creates a whole bunch of physiological changes in the body. And some of these can be really positive short-term, some can be really positive long-term, some can be negative short-term or long-term. It all depends on the context of who you are, why you're doing this, and how this is going to apply to you and how often you're using it. So let's start at this end of the spectrum because this is what's super popular right now, these faster hyperventilation type breathing patterns like the Wim Hof method, holotropic breathing, uh, breath of fire or any of the fast breathing methods that we do in yoga. There's a whole bunch of different ones um, And then also a very common breathing dysfunction over breathing people who breathe in and out too much air Than is necessary for the current state of demand super super common. You probably don't think you do this But what I found is it's extremely common and then also any type of hyperventilation or what we call superventilation which means breathing in excess of the current demands Hyperventilation is anytime you're breathing in excess. Superventilation is just a method that we use when we're doing it on purpose. So technically all of these would be a form of superventilation because you're trying to breathe fast on purpose. So what happens when we start to breathe really fast in this 30 to 50 plus breaths per minute range is it creates a whole bunch of changes in the body. This is what's typically known as a stress breathing pattern. So if you think about anytime you start to breathe really fast normally, if you're not doing it on purpose, it's typically when you're stressed out, you have anxiety, fear, some sort of uh, psychological distress, or you're exercising, which is a form of stress to the body. That stress creates this stress response or a sympathetic nervous system response. So we're going to have an increase in heart rate. We're going to have an increase in blood pressure, increase in respiratory muscle use. So the muscles that are doing the work are going to significantly increase because obviously we're taking triple the amount of breaths or more. So it's going to we're going to start using the muscles a lot more than we would. Uh, we're going to have a decrease in our carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide, which is a gas in our blood, it's going to start to decrease significantly. And actually, it'll be cut almost in half with about 30 seconds of this superventilation type breathing. 
Uh, and then this will actually decrease our oxygen efficiency. So what happens when we decrease the carbon dioxide, we don't use oxygen efficiently, and the oxygen that's in my blood doesn't get delivered to the tissues. So it doesn't get delivered to my organs, to my brain, to my muscles. It just keeps floating around through the blood. And that's why when we have people who have this type of overbreathing or hyperventilation syndrome, they end up having a lot of these physiological feelings of fatigue, lightheadedness, a little bit dizzy, tingly. All of those are, are sensations from this change in our respiratory gases, our low carbon dioxide and our high oxygen, but the oxygen not being delivered. If you've ever given a long presentation and you felt mentally drained afterwards, that's because my oxygen is not getting delivered to the brain because the whole time I'm talking, I'm over breathing. I'm lowering my carbon dioxide and creating this effect. So there's a lot of positive things can happen when we use this appropriately, when we use it the right way, and uh, when we can do it effectively in the short term. So that's why these breathing methods were designed to do this stuff on purpose to create some positive uh, benefits in the body. However, the reason that I say it's not the starting place for everybody is because this is such a common breathing dysfunction, over breathing, and so many people have dysfunctional breathing mechanics that this would be like if I took somebody who walked in off the street, never done a squat before, and I said, let's put your uh, one rep max on the bar or your five rep max on the bar and let's just start doing reps with it. What's going to happen is with their poor mechanics, with their, their poor core strength and they don't have good stab stabilization of their pelvis or their ankles, what, whatever the issue is, this is going to exacerbate those issues. And if we did that every single day, that person's going to get hurt because we know that we're just adding, what we're doing is we're strengthening the dysfunction that they already have. So if I know that somebody has poor breathing mechanics, which I would tell you 80 to 90%, I take that back, 90 to 100% of the people that I come across every day, whether they're personal trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, doctors, physical therapists, fitness and health professionals, or general population, 90% plus of them have dysfunctional breathing mechanics because we don't get, we're never taught how to do it. And our postures, our positions, traumas, all these things create these dysfunctional mechanics. Then if we take those dysfunctional mechanics where we're overusing my neck muscles, my upper chest, my trap, all these secondary muscles that are, should not be responsible for breathing, I start overusing those muscles because I'm overusing them anyway just to breathe because I have this vertical chest breathing, which is what so many people do. Now I start to add reps to that. Right? I start to do some fast breathing <sighs> on purpose. And I do that every single day. You can imagine how I'm going to start overusing the respiratory muscles. I'm going to increase this stress response in my body. And I'm going to create this strengthening, strengthening of the dysfunction. I'm getting more reps of this dysfunctional pattern. So what I tell people, and on top of that, most people we work with, I'd say the two biggest issues I see with every single person I work with, whether they're elite UFC fighters and military operators or average Joes, elderly populations, the, mo the two most common things, most people have dysfunctional breathing mechanics and most people are over, are driving way too hard. They're staying in that sympathetic response because they're just connected all the time and they have a lot of different types of psychological stress that keeps them in this elevated stress state. So for them, the two biggest things I teach them is how to get out of that state and get into a parasympathetic state and how to improve those breathing mechanics. So those are the two biggest takeaways that people come to with XPT and with all the different breathing that I teach. Then you can see how when we work on this end of the spectrum only, we're actually going to exacerbate both of those problems over and over again. So I say that these are more high intensity methods that should be reserved for people who have already fixed the foundation, who already know how to get themselves into a parasympathetic state and are not overstressed, and for people who already have good breathing mechanics so we can continue to reinforce on top of a solid foundation. If you look at the other end of the spectrum, we've got some of these lower threshold methods, the Buteco method or, or oxygen advantage, uh, pranayama, dip, all, a lot of different yoga breathing or what's called resonant frequency breathing, which is where they really looked at the response of heart rate, blood pressure, HRV, and how many breaths per minute these people were taking in order to create a, a calming effect on all those things. And what they found was that they actually uh, said that people should be breathing somewhere between 4.5 to 6 breaths per minute. 
is more ideal. So if we know our average is 10 to 14, but more ideal for most of our lives is in the four to six range, then you can see how adding 50 plus reps to people who are already above that average is probably not the best idea for them. And you can see the opposite effect here. When we use these slower breath patterns, think about any time you've been stressed out, what do people tell you? Take a deep breath, calm down, just take a deep breath, right? Slow it down. We know this intuitively. However, we don't ever practice it. So we don't, we don't have the ability, or most people don't have the ability to do this well. But when we do these slow breathing techniques, we start to bring it down. We see a decrease in heart rate, blood pressure, uh, decrease in respiratory muscle use because we're not going as hard and we're not breathing as much. So way less reps, right? We got six a minute versus 50 per minute. And one of the big things we see is an improvement in HRV, which is a very, very good indicator of overall cardiovascular, uh, your current cardiovascular state and your neurological state. So if, my, if I have a low HRV score, that's very well correlated with me being in a state of overtraining, over stress, over fatigue. So when we can see something that can improve HRV, that's going to, the higher my HRV, the better all the other functions of my body are, are doing those throughout uh, my day-to-day -day life. And then improvement in oxygen and carbon dioxide balance. When I slow the breath down and I control it, especially through the nose, extra tip there, uh, we can balance out the oxygen and carbon dioxide to make sure we're using both effectively because they're both super important. And anytime we, we unbalance them, we can create short-term changes that can be beneficial, but most people don't control it. They don't know how to do short-term changes. And what happens is this chronic overbreathing that creates a lot of long-term negative effects on health, performance, longevity, stress, you name it. Okay, so that's where both ends of the spectrum are. So here's my recommendation for you. If you don't know where you are on here, if you've never worked with a breathing coach, start on this end. This will do, this will pay out massive dividends in your life, your mental health, your longevity, your stress levels, your ability to balance carbon dioxide and oxygen, your HRV. This will pay off massively if you just work on slowing the breath down. Anytime you're doing focused breath work, focus on slowing it down. My recommendation, Keep a nice even, or excuse me, keep a, keep a nice one to two ratio of inhale to exhale. Really easy way to slow it down. Three seconds in, six seconds out. That's gonna put you at just about six breaths per minute. And then follow that pattern and you can move around from there. There's tons of different patterns you can use. Don't get stuck on one pattern or on one method. Understand this whole kind of spectrum of respiratory rate and these where these different uh, methods fall, just like exercises. You don't go to the gym every single day and just squat. You've got to vary these things up and you got to start off by building a solid foundation so you can add the more high stress exercises that are going to give you a bigger bang for your buck down the road, but you can't do that right off the bat. So that's my recommendation for you. You're probably somewhere in this average range or a lot of people probably closer to here and really where we want to be most of the time is over here. You'll be here during exercise. Leave that for exercise for now until you've mastered this. When you've mastered this, you've set a solid foundation, then you can start exploring some of these methods and, and exploring some of the really positive benefits from them. But if we start trying to jump into too much of this stuff right away, all you're gonna do is start strengthening dysfunction. We don't wanna lay dysfunction on top of dysfunction and create this stronger dysfunctional path because where's that gonna take us? You're breathing anyway, all the time. So every breath you take is either taking you steps towards optimization of your health, your performance, your longevity, your fitness, or dysfunction of all those categories. You get to choose if it's gonna to be towards optimization or dysfunction. So let's not layer dysfunction on top of dysfunction. Let's set up a solid foundation and let's start to build so you can lead towards optimization.